Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us. Uh, the Canadian Pulmonary Fibrosis Foundation today is very pleased to once again invite Tracy Reed to come and make a presentation on mast cells and pulmonary fibrosis. Tracy is a certified holistic national consultant. She's an instructor at the Canadian School of Natural Nutrition, and she was a recipient of the 2018 Clinical Excellence Award and co-author of Histamine Haven, The Essential Guide and Cookbook to Histamine and Mast Cell Activation. Her clinical practice has a strong focus in helping people struggling with histamine and mast cell mediated uh, health issues. She's a self-proclaimed guru geek, gut geek, I should say, and loves everything about the gut microbiome and leaky gut. Tracy's passion is teaching people how to eat to fix the biochemistry of their body and to address what is the root of their health conditions. You can find her at tracyreed.ca and histaminehaven.com. And for those of you who want to revisit this webinar and her other webinars and all the other virtual webinars that CPFF has hosted, please go to cpff.ca and under our virtual library resource tab, you'll find them all there. So thank you, Tracy, and welcome. Thank you. I am very, very excited once again to be here um, talking about a topic I love, which is food. And today I'll be talking about mast cells as well, uh, more specifically. Um, so uh, we're, this is the first in a three-part series. So yeah, really, really excited to be doing this. Um, so should I just go ahead and share my slides now? Uh, yes, please. Okay. Okay. So today's topic uh, is mast cells in pulmonary fibrosis. And the goal of today's talk is just to introduce you to uh, one of the underlying pathophysiology, so what's actually going on um, in your body with pulmonary fibrosis. And once we understand this pathway, then we can start to take some steps towards um, changing it. So really important that I start off with this little disclaimer. So it's important for you to understand that the information I'm presenting today is not medical advice and it's not intended to replace medical advice. I'm not a dietitian, physician, pharmacist, or other licensed practitioner. So my title is holistic nutritional consultant. So the content is not for diagnosis or treatment. Always, always talk to your doctor or primary health care uh, practitioner before you make changes to your diet. And the information today is really uh, for educational and wellness purposes. I'm going to see if I can move this bar a little bit out of the way. Okay, so today um, I'm going to talk to you about mast cells and what they do in the body. They're really, really cool. I loved talking about them. Uh, what happens when they go awry? So what happens when they're not working the way that they're supposed to? And then we're going to take a little bit of a look at what the research is telling us about mast cells and pulmonary fibrosis. And then I'll go through some other signs and symptoms to help you figure out if mast cells are actually playing a role in your wellness. And then I will leave you with a final thought. Okay, so these amazing mast cells. So mast cells are a type of immune cell. And in fact, they are from an evolutionary perspective on our planet Earth. They're the first mast cell that existed in mammals. So this makes them actually really, really unique uh, because as the very first immune cell that um, was occurring from an evolutionary perspective, they had to be able to carry out a lot of immune functions. They had to be able to really do everything that an immune system needs to do. So they're really, really complex for that reason. 
So all vertebrates on our planet have mast cells. And again, they're, they regulate many, many of our body functions. They're also involved in things like bacterial and parasitic elimination. So this would be part of a normal immune response. If you've got any kind of infection, your mast cells would be one of the immune cells that would be involved in dealing with that infection. And they signal other immune cells. And the next slide, I'm going to look at that in more detail because the signaling part is actually really, really important. So these mast cells are masters of signaling or masters of communication. So they are communicating with the rest of the body, with other cells in the body all the time. And they do this with chemical mediators. So these cells, one single tiny little cell contains over a thousand different chemical mediators. And if you imagine these chemical mediators as a language where each chemical is a different word, communicates something different to the body, then this kind of helps to picture, visualize how these cells communicate with other cells. One of the things they do is they attract leukocytes, other immune cells to amplify inflammation. So for example, if you cut your finger, then you would want to bring other immune cells into the site of that cut to help with tissue repair and healing. So they can selectively release chemical mediators. So again, they have over a thousand. And again, if you imagine these mediators as their language, the way they communicate, then they can release just one or two mediators. They can release a whole bunch of them. They can selectively release different ones in order to communicate different things to the cells in the body. So this is really, really profound and makes them very, very unique in the number of mediators they have and the ability to influence so much communication throughout the entire body. So this is their, the beauty of their complexity. So if we look at the human body, we actually see that mast cells are everywhere in the body. But there are some places where we find them in greater abundance, where they like to hang out. So we see a lot of them in our skin. We see a lot of them in the GI tract. And we also see a lot of them in our respiratory tract. So the lungs, which is obviously very, very significant to today's conversation, as well as the sinuses. And then also in the bladder. And so those first four parts of the body, the skin, the gut, uh, lungs, and the bladder, these are all tissue that we think of as barrier tissue. And so barrier tissue is tissue that protects us from the outside world. So with your skin, if you come into contact uh, with something um, it's protecting you, something toxic, for example, um, your skin is protecting you from that toxin. Your gut, uh, say you were to consume something that maybe had food poisoning, as an example, anything you ingest, the barrier of your gut is there to protect you from um, things that you might ingest that wouldn't be good for your body. Your lungs as a barrier are there to protect you from anything that you breathe in. So air pollution would be a really good example. Bladder is a little bit harder to sort of visualize as a protective barrier um, because we don't really have things normally going into our bladder just coming out. But nonetheless, it is also a barrier tissue. We also find lots of mast cells in our reproductive tracts, both for men and women, uh, in blood vessels and in the blood brain barrier as well. So again, that would be another barrier tissue. So when we look at the multifunctionality of these mast cells, again, they have the ability to do so much, but some of the key things that they're involved in are epithelial tissue, 
integrity and permeability. So epithelial tissue is that barrier tissue that I was just talking to you about. So we want that tissue, whether it's your lungs or your skin or GI tract, we want that to be really strong and have good integrity. Unfortunately, with many health conditions, we see that that tissue has actually become permeable. Uh, so we see that with lung conditions. Uh, and then we also see the same thing happening in like skin or uh, other barrier tissue where it, when there's a chronic health condition, there is often this permeability. So again, mast cells are uh, communicating either that integrity or that permeability by releasing certain mediators. They are involved as immune cells, obviously involved in regulation of the entire immune system. So there's lots and lots of other different types of immune cells. And the mast cells are kind of like the main head honcho when it comes to the immune system. And they're communicating to all the other immune cells and telling them what to do. Um, and again, we've already talked about this a little bit, but mast cells are really involved in this microbial defense. So whether you have a bacterial infection or a viral infection or a parasitic infection, your mast cells are there to create safety and help you fight off these infections. And then wound repair is another, another, another really, really important role that these mast cells are involved in. We also see that they're involved in endothelial function, and this is really, really relevant to heart disease. So if any of you um, are struggling with both lung issues and heart disease, this would be applicable to you. So when we look at the, the blood vessels, the health of the heart, things like blood flow, blood coagula coagulation, or even conversely, you might have really thin blood that doesn't coagulate. Um, and again, this permeability component where the vessels, your blood vessels, uh, either have integrity or they can become permeable. Interestingly, mast cells have a really, really big role in pain perception. And so that's a whole conversation <laughs> in and of itself, but it's really, really interesting again um, they're always communicating with other cells and they communicate with the neurons that perceive pain so they can really actually amplify uh, pain perception. Uh, excuse me, Tracy, if I can yes. interrupt you for one second. Um, a couple of people in our audience wanted to know for mast cells in lay terms, is it like the, the foundation of, for our immune system and everything that our body needs to regulate and to um, enforce, you know, blood flow, um, how tolerant of your pain. So mast cells, yeah, they do have this very regulatory role. So definitely for the immune system, for the immune system as a whole, I would say there's actually two big regulatory pieces. One is the mast cells, right? Again, they're communicating to all the other immune cells and telling them what to do. Um, and the other piece that's involved in immune regulation would be the gut microbiome. So these trillions of microbes that reside in the human GI tract, and they're communicating a lot of information to our immune system and regulating it as well. Um, mast cells, in other regards, don't have as much of a regulatory role, but certainly, again, because they're communicating to all cells everywhere in the body, uh, they are really, really important at like overall health and function in the body. So I hope that answers that question adequately. Thank you. Yeah. Um, and then finally, they're involved in smooth muscle contraction. And this is really actually important for a lot of the functions in the human body. So our smooth muscles, we find them in the GI tract and the bladder. So that smooth muscle contraction, we need it for gut motility. So to move all of our food through the GI tract and to eventually poop it out uh, for bladder contraction. So to actually be able to urinate um, uterus contraction. So for women, for uh, their menstrual cycle or giving birth, really, really important functions. 
and for men, sperm ejaculation. So again, these mast cells are really, really important everywhere throughout the body. So when we talk about mast cells, or if you were to go talk to your family doctor about mast cells, the thing that most doctors um, and many just lay people know that mast cells are correlated to allergies. And more specifically, there is something that mast cells release that we associate with allergies, and this would be histamine. So when you look at the graphic, I actually love the graphic on this slide, but you can see these cells, um, these are a representation of mast cells. And you can see that one cell, how there's those like little poofs of gray matter coming off that cell. And that would be a representation of these chemical mediators that are being released by the cell. So with an allergy, Histamine is one of the things that gets released with an allergy. So with allergies, you would see like this histamine release from the mast cells. And so again, doctors understand this very, very well. This is the most well-known mast cell response is an allergic uh, response. Now, I want to take this one step further beyond allergy and talk about something called mast cell activation disorders. And there's a few different ones. I've listed kind of these three main categories, systemic mastocytosis. And if you had that, you would know you would get a diagnosis really, really early on in life. Um, then there's something called mast cell activation syndrome where these mast cells are acting inappropriately. They're releasing a lot of these mediators when they shouldn't be. And the final one, this hereditary alpha tryptosemia, um, this is genetic, just like the systemic mastocytosis is, and not a whole lot is actually known about um, that one at this time. But they all share something in common, and this is inappropriate activation of the cell itself. So. If you look at the graphic now, instead of what we saw with allergies, where there were you know, a few releases around the surface of that cell of histamine, we see just a very inappropriate um, response where there's more chemical mediators that are being released than they would normally be doing. And because mast cells, so I talked about histamine in relation to allergies, but because mast cells have over a thousand different chemical mediators, the impact on the body can be really, really profound and show up in many, many different ways in the human body. So if we look at lung tissue now specifically and what's going on with these mast cells. So I've tried to kind of give you a picture of, you know, what they do, how they're doing it, how they're communicating with these chemical mediators. And we've introduced this idea that sometimes they don't work the way they're supposed to. So what we see in lung tissue is that there are actually more mast cells here than in other tissue in the body. So the lungs are one of the places where we really find a high concentration of these mast cells normally. What we see with fibrosis is that there's actually even more of an accumulation than we would see in normal healthy people. So we have more mast cells present. And these mast cells release things like, so these are some of the chemical mediators I've been talking about. So um, some of these names may be completely new to you, but maybe you've come across some of these in you know, some of the research literature or other reading that maybe you've done about uh, pulmonary fibrosis. So they're releasing things like cytokines and many of these uh, cytokines are very, very inflammatory. Uh, growth factor, proteoglandins, TNF, uh, which is tumor necrosis factor, interleukin-17, very, very inflammatory um, chemical mediator as well. 
And all of these different chemicals, they stimulate matrix remodeling. So what that means for your lungs is that they are changing the structure of the lung tissue. And so this is very well uh, researched. So this is known as one of the root contributing factors to fibrosis. So here's an example of um, one study that was done looking at some of these mast cell mediators. So again, these chemicals that the mast cells are releasing that would be associated with fibrosis. And um, so we see here this transforming growth factor beta is one thing that we see being released. And another is tumor necrosis factor alpha. So just to share one such paper um, with you. And that these, sorry, these are involved in the um, development of the fibroblasts, the fibrosis. So now with pulmonary fibrosis and collagen, we also need to talk about collagen in the context of this conversation with mast cells. So with fibrosis, collagen production is happening faster than collagen breakdown. Now, to give you an idea of what this actually means, collagen, I think of collagen as our scaffolding in the body. It is the scaffolding that all of our tissue gets built on top of. And so if we think of bones, uh, there's this collagen scaffolding, and then all those minerals, the calcium and the magnesium and boron and all these other minerals, get built on top of that scaffolding. Same thing for our skin, same thing for our lungs. So collagen is really, really important. Um, but what we see, again, we see changes in the lung tissue with fibrosis. And one of those changes is that the collagen is building up faster than it is breaking down. And so this starts to lead to formation of scar tissue. Mass cells are releasing chemicals that are initiating this collagen fibril formation or scar tissue formation. So again, these mass cells through their chemical release are changing what's happening in the body because they're communicating um, this action in the lungs. So now I want to talk you through some common comorbidities that we would expect to see or possibly see when you have pulmonary fibrosis. And these particular comorbidities are ones that have also been researched to have mast cell involvement. So as I go through this slide now, or as you're reading it, I want you to think about um, if you are a patient with pulmonary fibrosis, or if you're a caregiver, you know, think about the person that you are caring for. Do any of these conditions exist in addition to the fibrosis? So hypertension, high blood pressure uh, would be one possibility. Sleep apnea would be another uh, comorbidity that can exist that, again, has some mast cell uh, potential. Lung cancer, COPD, GERD, and ischemic heart disease. And so, you know, I started very early on by talking about how we have mast cells, uh, in particularly in our barrier tissue. Um, and that's why GERD or heartburn or reflux, there's different terms you can use for that. But the GI tract is another place where we see a high amount of mast cells uh, in that tissue. And so we do see things like GERD or reflux. Um, and then sleep apnea, uh, there are actually a lot of sleep related issues um, with some of these chemical mediators, especially histamine that gets released from mast cells as well. So again, these are just conditions that can coexist with fibrosis. And the research also supports that there is a mast cell involvement in these particular conditions. 
So hopefully for some of you, um, that's a little bit of a light bulb moment where, you know, maybe you do have heartburn and you've got fibrosis and now you're starting to make that connection that mast cells could be the common piece between those two. So then the next question we need to ask is, is pulmonary fibrosis a manifestation of a mast cell problem? So we know the lungs already just naturally have a lot of mast cells in them. Is it possible that the mast cells in your lungs are not working properly, are releasing too many of those chemical mediators? So the questions that I'm putting forth now are questions that can help you when you answer them, help provide a clue that there might be, might be mast cell involvement in your overall health. Because again, mast cells are everywhere in the body. And so typically, if there is a problem with the mast cells, if they aren't working the way they're supposed to or acting a bit inappropriately, then we would see that show up in other places in the body. So these questions are just designed to um, kind of raise a little red flag to get you thinking. So do you have sensitivities? And this is actually a really, really broad question because there are many, many different kinds of sensitivities that people can have. So I'll run through a few uh, different ones. So you might be sensitive to smells, particularly things like perfume. So if somebody is sitting next to you and they're wearing perfume, do you start to feel like maybe a little bit headachey, lightheaded? Maybe your stomach feels a little bit off. So perfumes would be a common one. Um, and a great place where like people who do have issues with this is if they're walking down the laundry aisle in the grocery store, right? All of those fragranced uh, laundry soaps can be difficult to handle if you have that type of sensitivity, but it could be other smells, paint fumes, gasoline fumes, things like that as well. You can have sensitivities as well to weather changes. So if you're that person that maybe gets a headache or maybe even gets a migraine, when the weather is changing and I'm in Calgary and we actually see this quite a bit here because we have Chinooks where we get a pretty drastic uh, weather change from like cold to warm and the um, atmospheric pressure changes. Um, so weather changes and that can again trigger all kinds of symptoms. I mentioned headaches and migraines, but some people feel joint pain or other symptoms when that kind of extreme weather change occurs. Some people are sensitive to temperature extremes. So maybe you don't tolerate hot or cold very well. Um, maybe you don't tolerate sunlight very well. Some people will get like kind of skin modeling with sunlight. Other sensitivities would include sensitivities to things like herbal supplements. So if you've ever tried herbal supplements and they didn't quite work the way they were supposed to, um, or maybe they, they didn't work at all, or you had like an unexpected outcome from taking herbals, that would be like a sensitivity to those, those herbs themselves. Some people are sensitive to vibrations. There's just so many different things um, that people can be sensitive to. So again, this is just a question like, is there anything that you know of in your life that you tend to be more sensitive to than a healthy person. We would also expect to see a collection of other symptoms or comorbidities. So again, um, you know, if mast cells are a problem in your fibrosis, we wouldn't just see it isolated to the lungs. We would see some of those comorbidities that I just talked to you about, or other symptoms. And another question you can ask, oh, I sort of touched on this one a little bit, have unexpected outcomes or are sensitive to medications or herbal supplements. So I talked about the herbal part of this, but for medications, this would apply as well. So maybe in the past, um, somewhere in your history, you were put on a medication. And again, it just didn't work the way it was supposed to, or 
um, it made you feel worse or it induced uh, a flare in some of the um, other symptoms that you might have. There is something called dermatographism, and I will explain uh, what this is. Um, so dermatographism is actually very highly correlated to mast cell involvement, and it's something that shows up in the skin. And just, I can't remember if I have it on the next slide. Um, yes, I do. So <laughs> here we go. So dermatographism, the image that you see here, this is actually a fairly extreme form of dermatographism, where um, on this person's arm, they have actually developed welts. So this would be like a hive. And but you don't have to develop these welts. Dermatographism is um, a mast cell response in the skin to pressure. So if, um, you know what, I'm going to stop screen sharing just for a minute so that I can uh, demonstrate this. Um, but if you were to take the inside of your forearm where the skin is a little bit more sensitive and you need to use a blunt object, you, the goal here is not to scratch your skin. The goal is just to apply pressure. So a really good thing would be like the end of a popsicle stick, or if you have a pen, some pens just have a blunt backing on them. Um, don't use one that's like pointed, but a popsicle stick is really good. I have really short fingernails, so my fingernails are not sharp. But basically, you just want to apply pressure, moderate pressure down the length of your arm. And if you start to see a pink line appear, some people will actually get a white line. And this is not a white line like, um, like a scratching line, like where the skin is kind of flaking. This would be a white line where the, the skin itself sort of loses its color. And then of course, some people will get this uh, hive response where that line actually welts up. This is also when people get that hive, it's also known as um, skin writing. And then the key thing, I'll go back to the slide here. The key thing with dermatographism is that this welt or red line, pink line, white line lingers. And so if you draw a line and it turns a little bit pink and you know within a few seconds it's gone away, that is not dermatographism. Um, you would expect to see that this mark would linger. So I usually kind of like to monitor, you know, for five to 10 minutes and see how long it's lingering. Um, dermatographism is something that I myself experience, but I now have under control. So now when I do that, I don't get a pink line, but in the past, um, I did for sure. So again, this is not, this is not like a, a testing tool. This is just a way to, um, ask yourself, you know, is mast cell, this inappropriate mast cell response, part of what's going on in my body. Not every single person who has mast cell involvement or inappropriate mast cell um, activation will have dermatographism, but it is quite highly correlated. I believe it's about 80% or more. So other signs, so again, I've talked about if you have a problem with your mast cells, it's not just going to be isolated to the lungs, it, there will be other signs in the body. And to be honest with you, every single person who has this inappropriate mast cell response has a completely different profile or symptom profile. So just because one person has pulmonary fibrosis and another person has pulmonary fibrosis, if those two people had this inappropriate mast cell response, the other symptoms that they have can look really, really different from one another. So I just want to give you some idea of what some of these symptoms could potentially be. There are many, many, many of them. So we've already talked a little bit about GERD and heartburn. So again, the GI tract, because it has a lot of mast cells as well, just like the lungs, it's not uncommon to see symptoms here, but you don't have to have symptoms here. So heartburn, things like nausea, diarrhea, do you have occasional diarrhea and you don't know why? Um, skin issues as well. 
again, because the skin is another barrier, just like the gut, just like the lungs, we would expect more mast cells to be here than other places in the body. So if you have eczema or had eczema in the past, I should actually mention these symptoms. You don't need to just look at your body now, what's going on currently, but these could have happened historically as well. So anytime in your life. Um, so have you, or do you uh, have eczema? Hives would be another one where they, you know, maybe just show up unexpectedly and you don't know why. So this would be different from, you know, I'm allergic to a cat and I'm petting the cat and I'm getting hives. This would be more like an unexpected, you're not really sure why you have them. Rashes, same scenario. Unexplained pain anywhere in the body. So if you think back early on in the slides, I mentioned that mast cells have a role in pain perception. And mast cells, again, when they're not really acting the way they're supposed to, they can potentiate that and heighten that pain perception. And so this could be joint pain, this could be chest pain, this could be abdominal pain or stomach pain. Um, you know, maybe you've had spicy food and you get like pain in your stomach. Uh, headaches would be another example of pain. Um, you know, TMJ pain, like again, that's sort of one of the joints. So all kinds of pain um, can, don't necessarily, but can have this um, possibility. Uh, Allergies. Tracy, yes. Can I just interrupt one second? Uh, someone wanted to know if you've gone through all these conditions. So if they had one or two of them, um, you know, how can they go to talk to their healthcare provider to say, you know, uh, I'm experiencing this. Do you think this is something more than mm -hmm. maybe what it is? And, yeah. uh, you know, how, how do they go about explaining that? Yeah. So that is actually a really, really good question. And I will do my best to kind of talk you through the options. So currently, there are actually very, very few doctors that know about this connection. Now, it's growing. It is the understanding and knowledge of this is growing really, really rapidly. But it is still really in, an, in its infancy. So um, the diagnostic criteria for mast cell activation syndrome only was established in 2012. So that was only 10 years ago. And it takes, people say that it takes from the research stage into medical practice that it can take about 15 years to make its way into medical practice. We're definitely not there yet. Um, so I'm in Calgary and in all of Calgary, I only know really of one, um, well, one mainstream GP. Uh, he's an immunologist allergist who understands this connection, but currently he is not taking new patients because he has a three-year wait list. So I think as patients are educating themselves, you know, they're going to doctors um, obviously in Calgary, this particular doctor is, you know, completely like full to capacity. So I think the first step would be to go to your family doctor and ask for a referral to an immunologist. Um, that would be the specialist that is most likely to understand this connection. There are other options, though. Uh, naturopathic doctors would be another option. Now, again, there will not be a lot of naturopathic doctors um, that know about this. But if you're looking for a naturopathic doctor, I'll actually, um, I'll stick this in the chat um, if I can. So maybe, Sharon, I'll just send this to you, and then maybe you can pass it on. Um, yeah, so if, if you're looking online for a naturopathic doctor that you could go talk to about this connection, you would be looking for somebody who has maybe listed in their area of expertise, a histamine intolerance or mast cell activation. 
Um, so I know, again, I'm in Calgary, we have a couple of naturopathic doctors uh, that are familiar with that. Um, so it's a little bit difficult right now. And right now, um, because I've spent the last two years really delving into the research on mast cells, and, and the reason I've done that um, is because I myself have mast cell activation syndrome. And I got my diagnosis through a functional medicine doctor. Um, and functional medicine doctors are doctors that have their normal medical training, and then they go on for further education to understand why symptoms are happening, what's going on in the body, not just like, okay, you've got these symptoms, let's get, you know, give you drugs or something as treatment. Let's actually ask the question why and see if we can't start to address what's contributing. So functional medicine um, is actually where the knowledge of mast cell issues is really growing rapidly right now. But this is a private form of medicine, involves a lot of uh, private lab testing. And so that means there are costs associated with it. And often these um, costs are actually quite high. So I find for many people that route is actually not accessible to them. Um, so I'm seeing a lot of people actually who are coming to me and saying, you know, hey, Tracy, I think this is what's going on, on in my body. So they don't actually have a diagnosis. And so they're saying, you know, I want to try a dietary approach. So then, you know, all we can do is try a dietary approach and see how much that helps um, their symptom profile. So to summarize that, you know, start with the family doctor see if you can get a referral to an immunologist. That would be, I think, the best starting place. Um, alternatively, you know, seek out a naturopathic doctor who has some experience with either histamine intolerance or mast cell activation. Those would be kind of the two different options moving forward. Yeah, okay, that is really good question to ask. Thank you. Um, so a few other things, um, auto, there are quite a few autoimmune conditions that have been researched to have a mast cell role, uh, Hashimoto's, rheumatoid arthritis, um, some of the like GI uh, related autoimmune conditions like Crohn's and colitis. Um, and then you can have eye and ear problems as well. So with eyes, it's typically sort of a conjunctivitis, like irritation type of thing. Ear problems, some people have that ringing in their ear known as tinnitus. Um, I've seen quite a few people have like blocking of their ears where it just feels like, you know, when you are like flying and you have that pressure change and your ears get blocked, they'll have that and it kind of comes and goes. Um, depression or anxiety. And again, there are so many reasons for depression and anxiety. So this one is actually really hard to tease apart. But I see many, many um, of my clients struggling with anxiety. Um, and we've touched on migraines already. For some people, migraines um, is a big part of their symptom profile and or, you know, those kind of weather related headaches. So I want to talk about just conventional treatments um, that many of you are probably use, utilizing right now. So drugs currently for pulmonary fibrosis are antifibrotic. So they're trying to prevent that fibrosis, that scarring, that you know collagen matrix buildup from happening. So they slow the rate of this by blocking mast cell chemicals. So we know the lungs have mast cells. We know these chemicals are part of what is contributing to the fibrosis. So these drugs are actually blocking those chemicals that mast cells release. Additional drugs can include things like steroids to reduce inflammation, drugs to manage things like GERD, if that is part of your symptom profile. Oxygen therapy, obviously really, really important. Staying active, obviously really, really important. 
So if we look at these drugs and mast cells, um, now I'm probably going to mutilate the names of these drugs, um, but the nintadanib, um, so this one inhibits CKIT receptors on mast cells, inhibiting kinase release. So a receptor on a cell, you know, I talked to you about how mast cells release chemicals so that they can communicate with other cells, but then cells also have to have a way to receive that communication and they receive it with these little receptors that are on the outside. So think of it as like a satellite dish sitting on the outside of a cell and that satellite dish is um, receiving information. And so this drug is actually blocking um, one of the receptors on mast cells, which then um, inhibits the release of some of these compounds. And then perfenidone, uh, this reduces TNF and interleukin 1 beta. So these, again, both are mast cell mediators as is TGF beta. So again, this is just reducing um, these mast cell mediators. So both of these drugs are actually indirectly um, blocking mass, blocking the cell itself from releasing or blocking the ability of those um, chemicals to be received by other cells. So it's like interrupting that communication process. So here's the food for thought piece of today. Here's what I'd like to leave you with today is this idea that what if in addition to your pharmaceuticals, you could use food and lifestyle factors to stabilize your mast cells and slow down the release of the chemicals from these cells, thereby um, or the ones that contribute to fibrosis formation. So this would be, in addition to your pharmaceuticals, some strategies that you could potentially think about. Now, these won't resonate with everyone, um, but these will be the topics of the next two upcoming sessions. So the first session following this one will be on the dietary piece, and then the final one will be on some lifestyle factors that are really, really aimed at uh, stopping these mast cells from inappropriately releasing excessive amounts of these mediators. Mm -hmm. So that's it for today's talk. Um, if you want to stay connected with me, uh, Sharon already mentioned um, two places to do that. So you can email me directly at mail at tracyreed.ca. Um, and Histamine Haven is the website. I have a couple of websites, but Histamine Haven is where, um, together with a colleague of mine, we have really tried to create a place where people can find resources uh, for this whole mast cell um, piece. And it's called Histamine Haven because mast cells release histamine. And Haven is, is this idea of like creating safety for these cells so that they don't keep acting um, inappropriately. So that is the end of the presentation. I thought it actually went really quickly. <laughs> well, not too quickly, but <laughs> um, so now I would like to open things up for any additional questions that anyone has. Well, first of all, Tracy, thank you for making your presentation. Um, you know, really interesting and in lay terms because that was a lot of information that you shared <laughs> with us. And I know from our audience, um, it, it is a little bit overwhelming, you know, because when you start looking at these mass cells, you think that everything's connected. And I wouldn't want everybody to go out there thinking that, you know, they're going to have to do something about this. This is just for information. Yes. To say, yes. hey, if you recognize these things, it could be the following things. Mm -hmm. Please consult your primary health care provider. Absolutely. Have a conversation with them and do that exploration about, you know, um, whether there's about tests that you could do or have a discussion, right? Yes, and, yes. Uh, and then also too, for our part two, when we talk about the nutrition with you, Tracy, uh, you're gonna help all of us to figure out, you know, what are some of the things 
common things that all of us should avoid um, if we're taking particular drugs just because uh, they don't um, gel well, they collide with each other, and they can cause problems. And uh, it's sort of, you know, general thing to, to look at, right? Mm-hmm, and, as, mm-hmm. and also about our lifestyle in our third part series, because, you know, to do a nutritional change, you also need to do a lifestyle change, right? Yes, you have and, to get into the kitchen. <laughs> yes. And, and I want to tell all of our audience that, you know, these are not going to be dr- dramatic or drastic changes. No, these are little things that you can do because we don't want anyone to feel like they're overwhelmed to say, oh my gosh, I can't do any of this stuff. And so one thing that Tracy is here to do is to help us to say, look, even by doing a little simple thing by, you know, just exercising or paying attention to what your mass cells are telling you, that that can be, uh, you know, good enough for all the things you need to do. Yeah. Um, yeah. So Sharon, just to build on that. Um, I mean, I'm so passionate about mast cells because I had a whole bunch of unexplained symptoms for my whole life. And so getting that diagnosis for me was, you know, pretty, pretty important for me to just understand what was happening in my body. And at the same time, I had been seeing clients who were struggling, Uh, you know, they had either gotten the diagnosis or were sort of in that process of getting the diagnosis. And so here I was both a patient and a practitioner. And I realized there just there weren't really any resources available. And this was still such a new area that, you know, the the knowledge, um, the education piece was really missing. And actually, in fact, just I think it was only within the last six months, a research paper came out um, where they had actually looked across many, many countries and tried to identify what like some of the big problem areas were with mast cell, you know, diagnosis and everything. And, And the biggest thing across all these countries was lack of education, right? Doctors don't understand this. Um, and so for me right now, my goal is one to educate people about this, um, you know, and everybody, lay people, practitioners, like anybody I can talk to about this. I think it's really, really important that this information is out there. And then also just to provide some resources. And, you know, when we talk about moving forward, if people follow through with the next two sessions, when we talk about the diet and lifestyle piece, and this would apply to anything regarding your wellness, right? You have to choose what resonates with you. And so, you know, for some people like diet is just not anything they're interested in, you know, or lifestyle change is not interested, right? So really important that people take the pieces of information from, um, you know, not just myself, but, you know, any practitioners, like what really resonates with them and, and feels like it's going to be something that they can do and do sustainably. So Tracy, we have somebody who asked, you mentioned about cycling. hopefully I didn't uh, say it wrong, uh, mentioned earlier, you said that um, they're wondering, is that also is what makes COVID that makes some people very sick because as a cycling storm? Oh, the cytokine. Yes, yes. yes. Yeah. So, okay. Yeah. Talking about COVID and mast cells is actually really, really interesting because with COVID, there was all this conversation around cytokine storms and, um, and cytokine storms are driven from immune cells. There are other cells besides mast cells that, um, can induce that cytokine storm, but there have been, I believe it's, two or three papers now um, published talking about um, mast cell activation and the severity of COVID. Because what we saw with COVID was that there were people who actually did not have a heavy viral load, right? They, They didn't have a lot of viruses in their system, yet they could have a really severe response, have that cytokine storm happening. Um, and so the research looked at like, is, is COVID a trigger 
in some people for this mast cell activation, this inappropriate mast cell response, or for some people, did they already have mast cell activation? Maybe it was really, really mild. And then COVID was the thing that kind of put it into like a state of high alert. So two of those papers um, were put out by the world's leading mast cell researcher, uh, Dr. Theo Herides. Um, and one paper was put out by Dr. Lawrence Afrin, who is in North America, is really recognized as like the leading uh, medical doctor. Okay. Um, yeah. Would you be able to send us those links, Tracy, so that we can I put it on our website that. and then yes. our community can have a look at it? For sure. Yeah. We also have another question. Someone wanted to know, is there any connection with the uh, morphia and mast cells? I actually don't know. I can't answer that question because I haven't looked into that specifically. Yeah, sorry. Okay, no problem. Uh, you were mentioning about um, how, you know, people have to sort of take what they feel most comfortable with nutrition and lifestyle change and looking at one of the, the triggers. Would it be helpful for our participants that if they took um, a journal entry, if they wrote every day about what they ate, what they did, maybe they could see a pattern, you think, so that when you come back to present next month, that uh, they can come back with some questions if they observe some things. Is that helpful? Uh, a, a journal entry for each of our patients? Available. Yes, actually, yeah, there's, yeah, it could very potentially be very useful. So I don't think a journal needs to be done for a long term. I would say like four days typically is pretty adequate. Um, but one of the things we'll be talking about next time is, you know, which foods have the potential to trigger mast cell stuff. So certainly from that perspective, if they've done a journal and, you know, we start having that conversation about foods and they look back and say, oh yeah, like, you know, on this day I ate whatever food and, you know, felt a bit worse, maybe that day or the next. Yeah, that would be, that's a great idea. <laughs> okay. And, and Tracy, could I ask you, um, you know, Given inflation, everything else happening for the next session, when you come back to talk about dietary, um, you know, nutrition and what you should or shouldn't, could I ask you to help our audience uh, to come with some suggestions for things that are not as expensive? Because, you know, a lot of our patient community are on fixed um, income. They're, they're, you know, they, you know, as you know, these days, milk and eggs and basic things are so expensive. Yeah. So perhaps if you could maybe also come back and help us or direct us to where you have it on your website to say, here are some inexpensive, you know, foods like fruits and vegetables, or whatever you're recommending to say that these would help you, but they're not that expensive either. And then, you know, people can then figure out how can we do that along with recipes, right? I mean, sometimes when you talk about particular fruits and vegetables, sometimes we don't know about them. We don't know how to cook them. So, you know, can you also come back and say, here's some simple recipes for you to try it out? Yeah. Um, you know, so if we could ask you to do that for the next session, just so that people, some people were saying, well, you know, if you're, if you're talking about foods, can you direct us about how to buy inexpensively, but nutritiously, and as well as how to utilize it in our daily diet? Like how, what can you put it in? Uh, what can you cook it in and, you know, make it so that we enjoy it, right? I mean, yes. I always use things like, <laughs> like Brussels sprouts, you know, uh, I, I never liked Brussels sprouts, but I know it's good for you. And so what <laughs> I found somebody did was, well, if you cook, if you stir fried it, with a little bit of butter or, or olive oil and some maple syrup or a little bit of brown sugar, it, it makes it more palatable. And actually I've, I've enjoyed it, right? So those are some of the things that if you could come back um, at the, the next uh, session. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Yeah, and yes. for those of you in our audience, our next section is gonna be on December the 8th uh, when Tracy Reed comes back to tell us about some of the food nutritional uh, things that she would recommend and so for those of you who are interested 
if you would like, uh, you know, keep a four day journal entry like uh, Tracy was suggesting. And if you're interested uh, when we have our registration open, you could submit that and uh, we could just gather some of the things that you're doing and then maybe we can just give that uh, to Tracy and then she can come back with some thoughts and, and discussion on that. Yeah, and if you decide to do that journal, write down everything you eat and drink as well. Okay, great. So everything you eat and drink over yeah. a four day period. Yeah. And let's be honest, community patient everything you eat and drink <laughs> don't omit anything because i know if, if i did this with my father he would omit several things right so, so i have to i have to share something with you because even the act of journaling of writing stuff down it changes your behavior right because if you're like oh i'm about to eat this chocolate bar but you know i'm recording my food so maybe today i won't eat that chocolate bar well, so it's yeah it's yeah. interesting so <laughs> that brings back to then uh tracy like you know for those who want to make a dietary change uh can you also come back with some helpful hints like you were just saying by writing down what you're eating and it kind of makes you decide to make a better choice because you're writing it down are there other helpful tips and tricks that you can share with our community to say here are some things that you know to help you out right? yeah for sure so great well, I want to thank everyone coming to our session. We're coming to the end and I don't see any other questions at the moment, but I invite everyone to come back. I invite everyone to, to write down what they've eaten and drank for the four days and, uh, and to submit that to CPFF when we register you for the next session so that we can get Tracy to come back and really give us some you know, down to earth advice, right? Because I always say, if you're going to make those changes, a lifetime of habits are very hard to change, but you got to do it in such a way that it's not onerous on you and you go, oh, I can make that little change. By making little changes, you actually make big changes, right? Yes. Yeah. Okay, great. Well, thank you everyone for joining us today. And just know that this uh, session will be on our website next week by Friday. And I want to thank everyone for coming and please do a uh, finish the poll at the end to let us know, you know, there are things that we missed, things that you would like to know, because that would help us and we can share that with Tracy so that the next session she can come back and sort of help and prepare answer some of those questions. So thank you again, Tracy. Thank you very much for coming today. And to our audience, thank you everyone and uh, wish you a good day.